All right, everybody, welcome to another Shots from the Winchester podcast presented by Greencastle. My name is Lindsay Folk, and I'm your host today. And I have with me a really special guest from Bear Hug Cattle Company. It's Ben Minden. He is an Army veteran, and he's going to tell us today all about his company, what they do, and uh, why they're so cool. So, Ben, welcome to the podcast. We're really excited to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Cool, cool. Yeah, so really Quick story about how Ben and I met. I was scrolling my TikTok page and I saw a video of Ben on a horse and talking about being an Army Ranger. And I was like blown away, instantly sent a message and said, love to have you on the podcast. So that's how we met. So I'm glad that I was uh, doing my scrolling that day. <laughs> yeah, perfect. perfect. Yeah. So tell us about your company, Bear Hug Cattle Company. Yeah, so the the really kind of short version is that uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit based out of Montana, and we help veterans who are transitioning out of the military or have transitioned out of the military get their first job in the ranching industry. And how we do it is we put on a 10-week vocational training program um, kind of across Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, where we'll take a group of four veterans and we'll teach them kind of the skills that they need to go work on a ranch. And we'll do a bunch of different training that kind of falls in a few different categories throughout the program. That's super cool. Um, so how how did it begin? Like, how did you get this idea to do this? Yeah, this is, a, this is a, unfortunately a little bit longer story, but to try and make it as palatable as possible. So I commissioned in 2015 as an infantry officer and then uh, went to the 101st Airborne Division as a platoon leader, finished up there and went over to 3rd Ranger Battalion um, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, so kind of in between deployments and stuff, I randomly, just totally by happenstance, met a guy in Columbus, Georgia, which is a very small town, who was a horse trainer. Uh, his name's Johnny Daffin, and we got to talking, and he said, hey, you know, have you ever ridden or done anything like that? And I said, no, not really. And um he was like, well, why don't you come on out to my place and, and try it? And I said, okay. And so I showed up at his, at his uh, place and he was a cutting horse trainer. So rode a bunch of cutting horses, fell in love with it. And then just over the next couple of years, got super into it and started showing, competing and, and just trying to ride as much as I could. Fell in love with the horsemanship stuff. And then kind of as I got more involved in that world, I just personally realized that there's a lot of similarities between the people who work on or own ranches and people in the military. Everyone loves hard work. They love being outdoors. It's community-based. It's team-oriented. Uh, everyone's always putting something else before themselves, which is very similar to the military. At, kind of at this point, I had watched a lot of buddies transition out of the military and go into jobs that didn't have those characteristics and that they you know, we're getting in trouble mentally or, or just not find the satisfaction that they had in the military. And so I started bringing some guys from work out to ride with me for, you know, a morning or an afternoon or a day or go do some work on a ranch that I was working on somewhere and realized that there was just a ton of guys and uh, ranger regiment who wanted to like learn how to do this stuff, but it's just basically impossible to get started unless you grew up with it or you just randomly happen to meet Johnny Daphne in Columbus, Georgia, who's the one person probably in the world who would just say, hey, why don't you come on out and try this? Um, so we started to put together this little program where we would take a few people here and there and teach them to do some stuff. And then basically the demand for people wanting to do that started to grow pretty quick. And then it's kind of over the course of a few years now evolved where um, we've, we've developed this 10 week program and we take four people at a time as a cohort through this 10 week training program. And then we get them uh, help get them placed on ranches for, for jobs afterwards. And it's been this really cool deal because now a lot of the ranches out West will call us and be like, Hey, I need a guy or a girl, or I need uh, someone this season or that season. And, and so we've kind of become like this little hub in some ways for, for hopefully getting people trained to do the job. And then people who are also looking to hire, um, you know, some high, high quality people to their ranches. We've also been fortunate to kind of fill that role in some sense. That's pretty cool. So 
did we mention where you're located? I'm not sure if we if we did in your uh, little spiel there, there, but just for everybody else, can we kind of mention where you are? Yeah, so I, I live about 30 miles northwest of Bozeman, Montana. But our so we tr traditionally we basically did a lot of the training in Montana and then would go to our Montana ranches, our Wyoming ranches, our Colorado ranches, finish the program, drive all the way back to Montana and do an end of year benefit ranch rodeo. Now we start in Colorado and just end in Montana. It's just logistically easier. So we actually have a camp leased in uh, Walden, Colorado, which is right on the Wyoming um, state line there. And that's where we do the initial training. And then we do a couple of Colorado ranches, go north up to a bunch of Wyoming ranches, and then go kind of finish out at the Montana ranches. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty cool deal, but we do cover a lot of country in the 10 weeks. Okay, so you're living like the real life Yellowstone that everybody watches on TV, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I I doubt we have as much money as John Dutton, but um, <laughs> we do travel a good bit. That's cool. So where did the name come from? I'm very curious, Bear Hug Cattle Company. Yeah, I, I actually get that a lot. I wish I had a better story for it, but <laughs> um, as a kid, my mom had done this painting on the back of this old uh, barn door this bear sleeping on a log and ed wrote bear hug in underneath it um and so when i built my house in montana i took that painting and hung it up in there and was calling my house the bear hug in and then you know from that i just was like looking for a name for this deal and just figured on calling it the bear hug cattle company oh that's really nice i like that i think that's a good story yeah, yeah. so it's not just you who does this. You're the founder, but you I'm assuming you have other people that you're working with. So can you talk a little bit about who they are and how they're involved too? Sure. So basically on the like on the bear hug like organic side, it's it's me and a buddy, Ian Concannon, who's the vice president. He he's been there since the beginning. He he also happens to be my best friend. Um so he and I have kind of been the ones on the bear hug side doing doing most of the fundraising and admin and all that kind of stuff and then you know we we are super blessed because the, the western community and the ranching community is just so generous with this deal and so when we do the training it'll be myself and johnny daffin actually flies out there to do the training with the guys for the first couple weeks as well so he and i will kind of do most of the horsemanship training and then once we get on the road We'll go, you know, we'll go to a ranch and their manager and cowboys will help do a lot of the training. And then we'll go to another ranch, their manager and cowboys help do a lot of the training. So um, we're, we're pretty heavily involved in the initial set of training. And then it kind of gets, we're just more facilitators as it goes throughout the ranching community. Um, but there's so many people who volunteer in so many different capacities that um, I do a disservice by trying to name some of them and not all of them. Okay. No, that's great. So talk through your training program. You mentioned that it's 10 weeks long. Is that right? So what 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 are the kind of things that people are trained on when they're going through the program? Yeah, so it's we say it's 10 weeks. It actually ends up being about eight weeks of like training because there's, you know, getting everyone there, getting everyone settled, packing everything up on the back end. But in terms of the training, so what we start with is just largely uh horsemanship and so it's kind of broken down into to two chunks the first chunk is a two-week block where we're doing nothing but just training on everything in a very controlled environment and then the the next six weeks is like when we're putting it to practice on different ranches so the those first two weeks probably 90 95 percent of the time is just spent learning how to ride a horse so learn how to move a horse around in a round pen, learn how to put a halter on, learn how to put a saddle on, learn how to take care of their feet. Then we get into riding, very, very basic stuff, start, stop, steer, turn around, you know, and we just do that for days and days and days and hours and hours and hours. And then, you know, e each person has a couple horses that are theirs for the summer. So they've got to do what they do on one, they do on all three of their horses. So it takes, you know, if you're just doing start, stop, steer turn around so just basic stuff it might take you a whole day to get through kind of all your horses if you're just learning how to do it um and then so we kind of start layering stuff on maybe you're you get you spend two three days getting comfortable with riding and it's pretty flexible like it just depends on 
how fast the slowest learner in the group can go. And so, you know, w once everyone's kind of comfortable riding in the arena, maybe we'll go ride outside, we'll go up and down some hills, we'll cross some streams, we'll open some gates, we'll load horses and trailers and talk about that. And then maybe we'll start dragging a log around the arena to simulate like you have something roped and then maybe we'll start dragging a log around outside. And so it's just kind of very progressive through those two weeks, which is we have kind of a the place we need to get to before we go to the ranches in terms of the training, but some it could vary widely based on how quick or slow people pick up the different training and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of our first two weeks is all just learning like basic, basic stuff. We'll rope a lot on the ground. We also do a lot of classes during those weeks, just the basic economics of ranching, cattle marketing, who's who in the industry, kind of the different types of ranches that are around. Um, and so it'll be like a lot, a lot of practical work and then just some, some classes and stuff in the evenings. Um, and then we go to the ranches in the, in the next kind of six week chunk. And that's when it really just like cranks up to a hundred and uh, no one's ready for it. Um, and so like the first thing we did last year was we went to Little Belt Cattle Company in Martinsdale, Montana which is um, owned and operated by two, two Navy SEALs. Um, really, really awesome deal, S super cool. They founded this ranch a few years ago and they've just been doing really well. So we went there and we did like a, a 101 level ranching stuff where we had the leeway to like mess a bunch of stuff up and go really slow and they're kind of very bought into the deal. So they're, they're okay with that um, kind of training wheel phase for us. And then from there, the next event we go to is a five day long traditional horseback branding in Sinclair, Wyoming, that is just like a really serious deal. And it's very, um, very put together. And there's like a lot of really, really good cowboys and cowgirls there and stuff. So like we, we go from the, our training is kind of the walk phase, the little belt week is the crawl phase. And then it's just a full sprint for the rest of the summer, just whenever we show up to the ranch whatever they're doing that week we just jump in and, and uh whether the guys are fully confident in it or not they just get thrown in there to do it so um whether that's branding or doctoring yearlings outside or going and gathering big big pieces of country that are you know half the size of uh rhode island um we just throw them in and pair them up with someone and, and send them on their way and just yeah learn a ton they learn a ton so that's cool it sounds like there's some similarities with like military training and that where you're getting kind of getting baptized by fire in some situations oh yes <laughs> that's, that's cool really so... interesting to watch the progression too because like the first 10 days are just pure nervousness and then you kind of get like a little overconfidence and then something will happen that brings them back to nervousness. And, and it's typically around week six or seven that you see like things actually start to set in and people start knowing enough where they can feel confident, go do something on their own. Um, they know the lingo. They know when someone says, hey, go over there and do this. They kind of like it's become a little bit second nature and everything. So, yeah, it's um, it's a cool deal to watch everyone go through that progression. Yeah, I bet that's very rewarding. I can I can kind of see where that would be uh, cool to see. So you have certain ranches you partner with. Uh, are there are they the same ones over and over again, or do you try to like try new ones or um, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we have what I would consider like a core group of ranches. So the ranches that have kind of been there since the beginning. Um, there's a, a couple in Colorado, a couple in Wyoming, and then the Little Belt Cattle Company in, in Montana. And so we make sure that we go to those ranches because they they all do things really differently. They're all best in class at what they do, and the leadership there is is really good. Um, so we kind of just make sure that those are the ones we hit. And then, but but you know, probably 30% of the time during that second six week block, it, it might be we're at a ranch. And they say, hey, the neighbor 10 miles down the road needs help for three days branding their calves. Or, you know, we'll get a phone call on a Friday and say, hey, I, I have this big gather that I need to do on Monday. Could you guys come have some extra people there for that? So 
you know, what we hit all the kind of core group of ranches that we go to every year. And then there's, there's always just one off going to help a neighbor, going to help someone down the road brand or something like that. So we don't really ever know what, what those are going to be. Um, but we do hit those core, core group of, uh, ranches every year. Okay. And, and why did you specifically choose those? Just because those ranches are really good at what they're doing and you want people to learn from the best in the game, or is there, I know you said there's a Navy SEAL, so obviously supporting a veteran, but are there any yeah, other so reasons there's why? there's a practical answer to this question. Then there's like the ethereal answer. The practical answer to the question is like, those are the ranches that I'd worked on. Like I know the I know the managers and and all that stuff and had had relationships with them. So they were super open to it. They're really willing. um, And they were kind of the first ones to to support the program out West. Um, The the probably more important reason is they're the best managers. They're the best crews. They all do things really different. So people get to see a really diverse range of you know, terrain, ways people operate, ways people ride horses, ways people run their crews, ways people fix fence. They just get to see kind of five or six really different ways of doing doing things, uh, which is great because you don't know what ranch you're going to go work on when you finish. So to kind of get a little bit of glimpse of everything is great. And then the little belt deal uh, that's found and run by the Navy SEALs is great because it's like that's like our dream end state for one of the people in our program is that they get out and they start a super successful ranch with their military buddy and uh, are, are, are crushing it. So um, that's kind of like the, go- the gold standard in our book. So we love to spend as much time as we can with them. Yeah, that makes sense. So talk about the application process. Somebody might be listening and be like, wow, this is speaking to me. How does somebody apply and how many people uh, go through the program at once. Yeah, so this is uh, this is tricky. So our application is open once a year for one month. Opens on October first, closes on November first. We it's a written application followed up by uh, interviews, and then we choose the people who are going to go through for basically the next season. Um, it's truthfully uh, like very competitive. Uh, be, there's hundreds of people who apply and historically we've done four per season we're doing uh eight this year so we've kind of we've we've doubled but like still you know out of 200 going from four to eight is not not that not that much and so um so yeah it's a written application a lot of it's just basic information what you did in the military there's some kind of uh, philosophical questions about what you think about being on a team and like how, like just us trying to understand how you think about working as part of a group. Um, and then there's a lot of questions about like why you want to do this, why you want to be involved in the ranching industry, all that stuff. And then we go from there, we pick people to interview. And then from the interviews, we pick the cohorts based on how we think their personalities will match with each other, how we think their personalities will match with the ranchers, what they want to do afterwards. And so what we're really trying to get at with the application process is someone who's just really, really, really wants to get into the ranching industry, but just hasn't had the opportunity to learn how to do it yet. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to screen for um, in that. Okay. So what unique things do you think veterans bring to this industry? Like there has to be some tie-ins to the things we learn in the military and, and the the things you're doing. I know you had mentioned like, some in the beginning, but can you just kind of reiterate what you think um, the unique skills are that veterans can offer to the ranching industry? Yeah, so so there's a couple. Um, one is probably just the work, like there's a mindset that comes in the military that work doesn't end at five o'clock, work ends when the job is done, right? That could be one in the afternoon, that could be nine o'clock at night. We've certainly had def- a, a good mix of both of those like when we're on ranches. Um, so, so that's one thing that like, I think veterans are naturally suited for the industry. They just kind of get that. It's like, well, I don't know what the day is going to look like. And I just, I'm ready to be here until it's done. Um, so that's one super hardworking. It's not going to bother a guy coming out of the army to be told that he needs to have his horse ready at four 30 in the morning. It's just kind of natural. They're used to working on small teams where 
they're used to the pressure of having someone count on you to get something done. Like if you're in the wrong spot on a ranch and something happens, like you've just caused like extra work and pain and maybe like injury to someone else to your left and right. It's very similar to the military. Um, and then also I think a, a pretty cool thing that translates well is th they're just used to solving really hard problems with very limited resources. It's, the same kind of stuff you see overseas, like you might just be faced with a problem that you've never seen before. And you you just need to figure it out. Like there's no option of like, oh, I'll just come back tomorrow and figure this out. Um, and so it's very similar in ranching. You're probably a hundred miles away from anything and you have a horse and like maybe two or three, like a pocket knife and a little piece of metal and some pliers or something, you need to fix a problem. Um, and there's no one that's coming to help you. There's no cell phone service you're not Googling it. It's just th that mindset of like, I need to solve this problem because there's no alternative, I think is something that military folks are really kind of well suited for. Yeah, that that's funny you mentioned that because not to plug Greencastle, but kind of have to sometimes because that's that's where I work. But part of what we do is is we like our our tagline is we get shit done and that's exactly the mentality we fit foe so whatever the situation is like figuring it out even the most complex projects like these veterans understand how to address that head on and not get too stressed out and and deal with some of that ambiguity just like you talked about so that's that's pretty cool um so i guess aside from you know you're you're doing this really cool thing you're also really like a business owner right so talk about your biggest challenge in getting this thing off of the ground oh man how much time do you have uh, <laughs> you can say more than one <laughs> yeah um it's like it's it's hard it's hard to start i i i didn't really i, I was ignorant going into it um because i kind of started in the military and then really put a lot of time and effort into it after I got out. And so I had no appreciation for how difficult it is to start something from nothing and then like build all the organizational structure around it. And like, I don't know how to do taxes. So like, who's doing the taxes? Like who's doing the accounting? Who's, who's fundraising? There's so much operational and logistical stuff that needs to go into it. So it's just, there's so many little things that need to like get put into place at some point that it's it's really difficult to just go from nothing to something. And so that has been, I mean, I'm still, that's still, it's not like I've solved that problem. Like that's still something that I'm figuring out, you know, four years later. Um, so, so that's just been, that's been huge. And then obviously as a nonprofit, like I spend most of my time fundraising, um, and I, I say this to people a lot, like who are like fundraising money for their business, like a new venture or something like you think it's hard to fundraise money for your new venture. And like you're promising to pay people back, like imagine what it's like for a nonprofit when like the people will never see their money again. Um, so it's it's it is it's a it's a hard part of uh, being set up as a nonprofit. And then um, I'd say one of the other things that is kind of a constant thing to deal with is people will have a lot of ideas about what you should be doing who are not really that involved with the thing especially as um, a business or an organization starts to become more successful a lot of people there's like a lot of noise about people wanting to get involved or wanting to steer you in a certain direction and just staying focused on the thing that you set out to start and do is um you know, it's like a constant challenge when you have 15 different people telling you, oh, may maybe you guys should turn this program into this, or maybe you should go do this, or maybe you should, you should run it like this. Um, just kind of staying focused on like your core mission or offering, I think is, uh, especially when you're in your early years, you're kind of just grasping at anything to get the, the deal off the ground. And so um, it's, it's hard at the beginning to kind of stay hyper focused on what exactly it is you want to do and like we've you know we went a bunch of different directions at first and we've gotten very 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 specific in what we offer and what we don't offer now and it's easier at this point to say no to stuff um that's not going to contribute to our core mission now but it, the first couple of years it's very hard to say no to 
to, to like non core things. Yeah, that makes sense. So kudos to you for staying focused, even though it is challenging. Um, so from all that, do you have any lesson that you've learned that you would want to impart to somebody else who's maybe trying to embark on, you know, growing a business of their own or starting a nonprofit? Like what's the, the takeaway you'd want people to, to kind of remember in the lesson? Yeah, one of the big things that I have kind of come to realize is, um, right, there's a, a lot of nonprofits doing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, and I got asked this a bunch by people who are kind of getting nonprofits off the ground. And um, I think it's really important before you start a nonprofit, like t you need to be solving a real problem. Like you need to have a, you, like you need to be solving something that is a, a big problem for a lot of people. It's the same thing in like a business, right? Like you need to be solving a real problem for a lot of people. Um, and so if, if, you, if your idea is not going to solve something like a real problem for a lot of people, then uh, may, maybe like a nonprofit's not the best way to go about it because it'd be really hard to get to get funding for it. Um, so that's kind of like one of the big takeaways that I've had from this whole process is like, if you are solving a real problem that has a bunch of different people invested in seeing this problem get solved, then it's it's going to be easier than if you have some very niche, uh, you know, strange thing that only affects five people in the world. Uh, I'm not saying that that it's not worth solving that problem too, but it's just going to be m much more difficult. Yeah, that makes sense. So we have the the lessons learned, biggest challenge. So there has to be something that sticks out in your mind that is like the biggest reward from all of this. Like, what's the most rewarding thing of embarking on this journey so far? Um, I mean, there's so much that's been rewarding about this, um, and I don't even know if rewarding it would be the word that comes to mind it's just like the, uh, the this whole deal has shown me so much cool stuff about people and uh watching the ranching community and this group of ranches that we work with buy into this idea and be so supportive of it with their time and resources and energy that's already so limited like how much the community has given back to us for this deal has just been like tr truly eye-opening so th that's to me that's been the coolest part about this is is getting to see that like whole community kind of rally around an idea uh that that's been really rewarding uh the other thing that's been really rewarding is just seeing people what they get out of the summer a lot of times they get more out of the summer than than they may be expected to get out of it right so we talk about like what you'll learn and you'll learn how to ride a horse and take care of cattle and drive a truck and trailer and work on a tractor and all that kind of stuff. But the the people who have gone through it have, have had a lot of different feedback of, you know, it's just been good to get plugged into a new community. It's been great to, you know, have two days on the back of a horse without talking to anyone to think about stuff. And there's a lot of these ancillary benefits that come out of this deal that, you know, we don't normally talk about or, or preach about, but it, it's cool to see those. So you were in the military, right? You're in the army and you at one point had to transition from being a service member to being a civilian. Um, you know, not everybody's going to want to be a, a rancher and not everybody's going to want to be a cowboy, but what tips could you give for somebody who's looking to leave um, military service and transition into civilian life? If you could give maybe like, you know, a few tips. Yeah, I, I would say there's probably like three things I would say. And if I could generalize kind of like our deal back out to a wider audience, it would be one is the thing people love about the military is the community. So if if you're going to leave the military, like find the next version of your community outside of the military and be really serious about getting plugged in and being a part of that. Um, the second thing I would say is the other thing people really love about the military is the mission, like helping, making a change, waking up in the morning and feel like you're doing something that's important, like find something that satisfies that for you outside the military, whether it's volunteering or doing a job that you think is really important, like find find that thing. And then pr probably the third thing I would say is um, like continue to invest in your relationships that you made in the military, even when you're not in the military. Um, so, so yeah, those would probably be like the three big 
buckets that I would see when people don't do them, they get in trouble. Um, and when people do do them, they they honestly like don't really miss a beat. Uh, if you can solve the community, the mission and like the relationship piece. Great advice. Thanks. Yeah, that and we reach a really wide veteran audience. So that advice is always, you know, taken really well from them. So you mentioned that people can donate. Is there a way if somebody's listening to this and they want to donate, is there somewhere that they can go to do that? Yeah, you could just go to our website, which is bearhugcattlecompany.org, and there's just a button you could click um, right there to, to donate. And, uh, you know, our, our shameless plug is like we are 100% like donor funded. Like the only reason we could do this is because of people's generosity and no one uh, in our organization has ever taken a dollar. So like every dollar that comes in goes straight to providing the actual uh, service to the to the people who are transitioning out of the military. So I think that's probably another uh, unique thing about us. Like a, a lot of other nonprofits have big expenses tied up in all different kind of stuff. But our deal, we've just tried to create it so that you know no one ever needs to take take a dollar from it. So um, that that's been pretty neat. Great. Okay. So we'll make sure we plug the website, um, you know, in the comments and, and in the description on YouTube and everything so people can get to it really easy. Um, if you had to give, and this will be the last kind of question I have for you, if you had to give leadership advice to somebody, um, what would your biggest lesson be that you've learned either in the military or, or running this nonprofit? You know, what what's your advice or what's your lesson learned in uh, leadership? Yeah, find someone smarter than you, like my best friend Ian, and have him make all the decisions. <laughs> um, no, I, I'd probably say, well, actually, that's like a half joke, but it's totally true. Um, you know, he's been a sounding board for me on everything. Like, if I'm emotional about a decision, he'll be unemotional about it. If he's emotional about a decision, I'll be unemotional about it. Um, so, like, having, I think, in terms of leadership, like, having a counterbalance like that, um, is is totally invaluable. Um, so that's critical to like surround yourself with people who are gonna like make sure that you're making the right decisions on a bunch of stuff. Um, so that'd be one piece. And then maybe to generalize it a little bit more is, um, you know, like uh, my, my um, philosophy is kind of like tr try to make as few decisions as possible. And so, I think if you have the people who are executing stuff or buying in on it or um, or or running little pieces of it, just like they're totally capable of making decisions on their own. If you've done a good job of communicating like the direction that you need to go and kind of the constraints on how to get there, like they probably are going to make a better decision than you could make anyway. Um, and so giving people the freedom to do that, not only it's it's better for them like they're more engaged they're having more fun they're having more ownership but like you're probably going to get a better decision anyway and there you know there's obvious exceptions to that where like someone in a leadership role needs to kind of uh, course correct or do something like that but i think the probably the going in position should be let the people who are at executing the stuff make the make the decisions um and it's like your responsibility as a leader to to make sure they know which direction everyone needs to head and how they kind of need to get there. So that'd be my my view on it. Yeah, spoken like a true leader. So thank you for that. Um, if people want to learn more, aside from your website, which again, we'll plug, where else can they go? Do you have social media? Yeah, we have, um, so there's actually a couple uh, videos that ha have gotten made on YouTube where you just type in Bear Hug Cattle Company, you'll find them. They do a pretty good job of kind of showing the program and uh the, the the guys who went through this past summer and some of the stuff we've done some of the ranches we've partnered with that's a pretty good source if you're if you're highly interested and want to spend 15 minutes watching youtube videos and like go there if you want to just kind of cruise through some stuff our instagram bear hug cattle company has a lot of a lot of little snippets about it and then um you know i'm i hate to admit this but we did start a TikTok, you know six weeks ago and uh, have been putting a bunch of stuff from the Instagram over onto onto TikTok. So I guess I guess that's a place you could go to 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 see it as well. And and let me just say because that's how I found you. Your videos are really good. They're not just like anybody's TikTok videos. Like they are 
high quality, like slow motion riding the horse. Yeah, so really I cool. can't take credit for that either. I want to make sure that so uh, Julian Rivera, who is a really good friend of mine and Christian Smith, also a really good friend of mine, they came out for the summer and did a lot of those videos. And then uh, we had a friend, Emmy, who's a who's a really, really high quality photographer out in Montana, do a lot of them as well. Um, and so they, they are the creators of all that stuff. I cannot take any credit for that. I'm just literally the one who uploads it to the to the page. So. Um, or you're in the video, right? You're the you're the star in there. So uh, I, I hope <laughs> I hope to be in as little of the videos as possible. But um, <laughs> I unfortunately am in some of them sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Anything that we forgot? No, I just want to say thank you for the time. I appreciate, you know, getting to come on and chat. It's been it's been super fun. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is Ben from Bear Hug Cattle Company in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, check them out on their website, their social medias. We'll have them linked. And as always, please like and subscribe to our channel on Shots from the Winchester. We really appreciate all the likes, comments, and interactions. It definitely helps, and it'll obviously help Bear Hug Cattle Company get their word out too. Um, and and please like and subscribe to all their channels and everything that they do. So Ben, thank you again. It's been really awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.